Okay, in this phone consultation, I'm going to be talking to somebody who is interested in learning a little bit more about protection work. So she has a Mastiff, and this is her, this is her second Mastiff. She's a dog trainer, so she understands the basic principles or even the more advanced principles of dog training. But in terms of protection training, she's kind of new to this. So she's calling me, and she wants some uh, questions answered regarding protection training and how specifically that could be tailored to a dog like a Mastiff. If you know anything about protection training, protection training involves a you know a couple of drives developed nicely and well-balanced. And the other thing about protection training is it is very different from breed to breed, okay? Or it can be very different from breed to breed. For instance, how I train a Malinois and how I train a, a Mastiff, um, you know, let's say um, a Corso, the approach is going to be different. There are two different types of dogs. The way they mature is going to be different. And so the training has to be tailored to the type of dog that you're working with. And that's what I go over uh, with her on this call. Um, I mean, even if you bring me two Malinois and same breed, and one particular dog has a different set of traits, a different, uh, you know, different genetic, uh, different temperament, different genetic envelope than the other. Even there, my approach is going to be different as well. So in this call, I'm going to address the drives. I'm going to address how we're going to do it. I give her a, a lesson plan, and I give her an idea of what the expectations are going to be. So enjoy. When people think of personal protection dogs, the typical reaction or the typical image that comes to mind for most people is, you know, a dog that's going to bite. And in reality, there's a little bit more of a breakdown to it, right? So um, you have really, you know, like three basic categories if you were to look at this, these types of dogs. You have a dog that is that could be an alarm, and right? mm -hmm. like these dogs don't even have to bite. They're pretty much like the there's something going on, there's something going on, there's something going on. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a really good dog to have to kind of help you in the personal protection aspect of it. Mm -hmm. The other type of personal protection dog is the kind that you kind of described, which is, you know, a presence. Mm -hmm. Where this dog, this type of dog might never, you know, more than likely even ever bite anybody. But as long as there's a presence and as long as, you know, um, Dog has a, a little bit of that um, defense uh, drive, mm -hmm. and it's properly channeled. Like that alone is enough for like so many circumstances, so many like a bark uh, and hold situation. Yeah, I mean, not even like a bark, but just the second. Let, let's say I'm a bad guy, and I'm you know kind of casing the neighborhood and looking around, and I see your house in the neighborhood, and and I see that you have this big dog that automatically makes your house way way less likely to you know to be broken into way makes people way less likely to mess with you mm -hmm. because of what you talked about the presence uh and then you have your dog that is you know the typical image of like terms of the personal protection dog which is a dog that has the presence can have the alarm and will even bite right will even bite okay. and do it in a very uh calculated manner not like uh you know trigger a liability. happy yeah. liability just by anybody that you know that that looks at me wrong type of thing yeah so um based on what you're looking at based on your scenario and also based on the type of dog that you have i think like you're mostly suited at least from this very quick perspective that i'm getting mm -hmm. for the presence where we can still teach the dog to bite um, but like the main focus would be, you know, presence. That's in that. I know what your dog looks like. I've seen it. You add another, you know, 40, 50 pounds to that dog. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's alone. That alone is, is, it's just such a huge deterrent. Um, so now let's go into, uh, you know, into how we would train this and, um, and, and the types of drives and how, you would do that with a mastiff because every breed is different. Every type of dog is different. And by the way, as I'm going with this, feel free to slow me down and stop okay. me and ask me questions like any time you want. Okay.
Okay. I really and just wanted to hear. I wanted to hear your thoughts in a, in, in a way that wouldn't interrupt you. So, like in yeah, the yeah. class or whatever. So. Yeah, yeah, no worries. And but but like I said, if, if you ha- happen to have a question, either write it down and then ask okay. me later, or just like shoot it right out. Fine too. Okay. When it comes to protection training, um, you know, you got you know one of the main drives is that that we use is defense. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the defensive drive. What it is is, it's not a, it's not fun, you know. Like what it is is, it's the the dogs or the animals' ability to see a threatening situation and figure out the best way to survive. Right? If you look at it fundamentally, that's pretty much what it is. Threatening situation. Uh, what do I do to survive? Not two strategies that I can use. Really. Fundamentally, three strategies that I can use to survive a threatening situation. I can run away. Um, I can, you know, give up. Basically, I just, I don't run away. I just stay there and let it happen to me. Or I can attack, right? Mm-hmm. So, with defensive drive, for protection training, we want the last option, right? We don't want it to run away. We don't want it to give up. We want it to stand its ground, right? We want there to be enough of a sense to go. There's a there's a threatening situation here, and I need to I need to do something about it. Which is something that you're familiar with. Yeah. It's something that you know we were just discussing here a little bit ago as we were talking about corsos. Yeah. But but here is the here is a little bit of the issue with defensive drive. Because it's not fun. It tends to be a little bit of a reactive type of you know state. Mm-hmm. Where, like, it happens to me, and I got to do this right now to survive, right? Yeah. Um. So the other thing is, it's not fun. Like the dog is, you know, we don't just train the dog, the dog to be put in this scenario and go, hey, you got to bite and go, hey, man, that was fun. Yeah. Um. There is stress that goes into it. You know, there is there is that issue, and, you know, with some dogs, you actually have to work pretty hard to get them into defensive drive because they're in prey mode so much. Whereas in some dogs like yours, it's quite the opposite. Right? Like, like to them, it's just more natural. They're more prone to be immediately in defensive drive, where it can be harder to bring them into prey drive. That's and very that's, difficult. Right? So when when we talk about protection training, prey drive. So how prey drive, how this is a fundamental drive to help the species and help the you know the uh, the individual, is what prey drive does is it motivates the dog to get food, right? Um, so when you see uh, when you see your dog, when you see an animal, a, a prey animal chase a bunny, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a predator, I'm sorry, when you see a predator chase a prey animal, yeah. um, they're, they're not afraid. This isn't like, oh my God, I have to, I have to survive. You know, I have, I'm in a situation where I have to run away, attack or, or give up. It's yeah. more of a, um, you know, I, I, I'm motivated, like the movement, the chase, all of that just drives and fuels the dog to be motivated to chase that moving object, right? So in protection training, that's exactly how we translate that into, hey, we're going to do this for the person. I want to do this for the helper. We're going to do this for the decoy. And here's, here's how that goes. You have the helper, you, you, know, uh, you know, you could start with you too. Where you let the dog know, hey, you know, let's play this game where you get to chase this thing and you get to bite it, right? Thus, triggering that predatory drive where you go, hey, you know, there, there's a prey, there's a prey, grab it, there's a prey, there's a prey, grab it. Eventually, that translates into a sleeve. There's a prey, there's a prey, grab it. Prey, 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 grab it. Eventually, I can translate into a full bite suit, and then we can utilize that to get the dog into you know into the the type of protection though that you know will bite and can calculate it it's not stressful doing the bite work uh and it's just you know having a good old time ripping the guy you know to shreds right uh so the the huge benefit of working in prey drive when it comes to protection training is that in prey drive the dog there's very little stress like very, very little stress. The dog is just in chase mode. Um, it also allows the dog to 
when they do encounter little stressful scenarios of the bite work, mm-hmm. it allows them to, um, you know, to move past that thanks to prey drive. I have seen dogs that, you know, they're, they're prey monsters. And the second you, you present a threatening gesture, a threatening situation in the, in the scenario, mm-hmm. because they have so much prey drive, like the prey drive just carries them right over it. Okay. Right, so yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, it just it just allows them to like cope with stress a little bit better because they're like it's just prey, it's still prey. That's kind of what I've been doing with Rain and this whole direct socialization with adult males. I'll start playing ball with her and then just kind of get the ball to the guy, like my neighbor or whoever. Mm-hmm. And then the game continues, even though previously, like she would she would you know want to create distance and be like, oh uh-uh, no. And whatever be a little fearful but then she'll yeah. engage and she'll play ball and it's just like really quick moving on yeah um, no that that's kind of thing. you're absolutely on the right track you know doing that for sure so um so in prey drive you know doing protection and prey drive is just so helpful um now here is the uh here's the disadvantage of uh you know like operating primarily on prey drive right if you operate primarily on prey drive and not that you're going to have this issue with your dog, but I'm just kind of giving you a little bit of background info so you're very aware of these two. The the one disadvantage of operating primarily in prey drive is, um, you know, a dog could have immense prey drive, but if if they their their defensive uh, mechanics or their defensive training hasn't been you know even introduced, uh, they're not taught how to deal with stress like that. What happens is they just go, well, crap, this bunny is just not a bunny anymore. This is a threatening gesture. I want nothing to do with it. And then they can be full too. I'm out of here. Um, that's why it's not, it's not uncommon, unfortunately. It's not unheard of to, to have police dogs chase the bad guy. But once the bad guy picks up a stick, turns around, the They're police out. dog run, runs away. I've, I've yeah. seen that happen on videos. I've heard of that happening before. Me too. Um, and it's when these trainers don't understand that nice balance between prey drive and defense. Right? Like we want to work on both of them. So with your dog, um, you know, uh, mastiffs are very, very known for two things, right? When it comes to protection training or in general, really. They're very known for maturing Super slowly, oh. really, really slowly, which actually brings a little bit of a challenge to um, – can bring a little bit of a challenge to the protection training because what happens is when they're maturing so slow, uh, one of the things that happens with maturity with a lot of dogs is as they mature, their, their drive starts to develop just on their own. Yeah. Right? So the prey drive – Sometimes on some dogs, it's not there quite as much when they're younger as it can be when they mature. With some dogs, you see them right out of the womb. But with some dogs, um, you know, with a lot of dogs actually, you know, as they get older, their drive, you know, their prey drive gets more focused, uh, you know, and it's just a little bit easier to operate from that mode. But, uh, you know, in Mastiffs, it's just, you know, they mature super slowly. So this means prey drive could potentially, you know, take a little bit of extra time to build and for her to, you know, to kind of channel into it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, the other thing, uh, potential challenge, you know, with a dog, with mastiffs and other types of dogs like that is because they're, uh, you know, they're more prone to be activated in defense. Mm-hmm. Um, it can make protection training super slow um, and or not enjoyable. And here is what I have seen dog trainers do when they do protection training with that type of dog. They'll do a lot of defensive work. Like they'll corner the dog, they'll poke the dog, they'll do all these kinds of things to finally get the dog to go, dude, just leave me alone, I'm going to bite. And they consider that success. Now, if if you're looking for like, you know, like a junkyard type of dog, 
then, you know, that then approach that's makes sense. Go. Yeah, it makes sense. You're just like, dude, no, nobody's going to be a friend, right? But if yeah, you're looking for like, exactly. But if you're There's looking for no like way. a family dog, or you want a dog to be social, uh, you want your dog to be good with your clients, that is the last thing you want to do. So I caution you to be very, very careful yeah, I'm not where you get your advice. Where, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've gone through a lot yeah. of people. Believe it or not, I've gone through quite a few people. Yeah, good, good. So it's good that you're doing your research. Really yeah. good. Uh, so here's, here's what I would do with your dog. And, and um, I strongly recommend this. And uh, obviously, this is also from like those two times that I've seen your dog. Uh, if I see your dog more, I'll start to kind of fill in the blanks and go, okay, okay, I, I think maybe we can do this now. Okay, I think maybe we can do that now. Yeah. But here's what here's the plan of attack that I would have for your dog. Here's what I would what I would recommend. Uh, one, definitely just be prepared for this journey to take several months, if not even a couple of years or at yeah. least a year. Okay. Then be ready for that journey to take, you know, at least a year, right? Um, some dogs are known to not mature fully until they're like three and three and a half. That, not that that's going to be the case with your dog. That's just to give you an idea. I've seen dogs flourish at three years of age where like the first three years of their lives, they look like, you know, they look like crap. They were, they were like, what is this dog doing? Three years of age hit, three and a half years of age hit. Some of these dogs just become like jewels on their own, just maturity wise. So, um, uh, not not that your dog's gonna take three years. But I'm just giving you an idea. That I'm kind of is, in for a process. I'm, yes. I'm good for that. Yeah. I'm yeah. It's definitely process. gonna. It is definitely gonna be. Um, you know, definitely gonna be a, um, a a journey. So here's the other thing that I would do. So once I'm prepared for this to take a long time, the next thing I would heavily focus on is tons of socialization. Like. Yes. If you have this dog that is already a bit on the defensive side, the one thing that would be my very top priority would be I want to do everything I can do to make this dog a social butterfly. Like everything in my power, because there's only so much you can do yeah. before genetics kick in and tell you, do you can do that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But but if but if it is, you know, if like you know, a, a good percentage, a huge percentage of that is something that I can do, I'm going to take advantage of it. So I'm going to do everything I can to make this dog a social butterfly. Right? Like I I would want it. I wanted to love people, or at least I wanted to feel comfortable with people. Yeah. Like you, you don't even have to love people, it, but but if you could at least, you know, if I could at least make you comfortable with people. All right. I'm going to do everything I can to, to make that happen first before I start thinking about, you know, uh, defensive drive, developing defensive drive and all of that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so you can do that by the way you've been doing it, which is basically counter conditioning. That's yes. pairing up prey drives, you know, like, uh, you know, toys, the ball, whatever the dog likes with the people. Definitely keep doing that. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, have you heard of the game of seven? No. Oh, what? Seven different, is it seven different things? Is it that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So ba basically what the game of sevens is, um, and what I like about the game of sevens, like putting it that way, is that it gives me, it gives me a better map yeah. than, than just, you know, if, if somebody tells me, hey, we'll uh, socialize this dog to as many things as possible, that's, that's such a relative concept to each person. You know, like if, if I tell one person, hey, socialize this dog to as many people as you can, to that person, that might mean three people. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Exactly. So here, yeah, so here's what the game of seven, um, you know, here's what it basically is. It's um, pick seven categories, okay? So one of your categories could be people. The other category could be um uh, flooring surfaces. Okay, yeah, yeah. This is what we yeah. did when she was like little, little. It was like exactly. tarps yeah. and balls and water buckets yeah. and ladders and 
all that stuff from like eight weeks until shit, yeah. five months or so, yeah. five and a half months. So basically, it's pick as many different categories as you can come up with, you know, uh, outing, um, you know, crowded places, places with uh, traffic. Uh, obviously, all of this has to be safe, safely yeah. done. Yeah. You know, uh, if you want to throw in feces, you can do that safely. Definitely do that. Okay. Um, different types of dogs. And here's what, what you do, right? Once you have your categories laid out let's say one of my categories is people now i'm going to tag that category and what i'm going to do is i'm going to try to find seven different types of people right okay so by that i mean not just people by that i mean you know i'm going to find young people Old people. People in wheelchairs. Middle aged people. Yeah, all of that, right? Um, females, males, um, white, black, Asian, um, hats, uh, people that walk weird, people that uh, walk like they have a stick up their butt. <laughs> anything. Anything. Right, okay. and and you try to find all those people because it's very easy to go. I'm just gonna go with my dogs with these type of people, but then you realize later that you only socialize your dog to you know to uh, Caucasian, right? To just white people, and then dogs like a year and a half year a year and a half old, and uh, no problem. Yeah, and and then like the dog sees an Asian person for the first time and now the dog's freaking out. Right? Like all those things count. So do that. Do your category find your categories and find seven different types of that category. And uh okay. and just like do it in a safe way as possible. Because here's the other thing, right? So it's not just going, hey, I found my seven people, let's throw them in there. Cause then because then that could actually be not helpful for your dog. So what you yeah. want to do is, let's say you find seven, two, three different kinds of people, three people are willing to help you. You do is, hey, uh, you know, here's some food, here's some bill jacks. I just want you to toss some food at my dog. Uh, I just want you to, you know, throw the ball for my dog. Like little things like that, right? Yeah. Uh, if you find seven different surfaces, um, you know, you find like a, a crowded place, place that's not very crowded, high traffic, low traffic, some machinery in the background. Um, you know, again, you want to do it safely and uh, and uh, and slow as per, as possible. Where you're going, right? I mean, I know this is kind of new to you, so I'm just, we're going to take it slow. Uh, in the event that you can do it slow and you, you your dog suddenly finds itself in a very uncomfortable position, then you can possibly default to flooding. Uh, if you feel like that will be the best option, the better alternate alternative. Okay. And you're not just quitting and leaving. Um, then once you do that, right? Like uh, I will be prepared to do that for uh, you know several months. Yeah, she's gonna go into now, her third fear, fear period, and it'll have to be done through then too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then what you can yeah. what you can still do in order to you know so you don't feel like you're falling behind in protection work is you could uh, keep doing what you're doing. You get a rag and you just kind of play with the dog back and forth. Where you start developing the prey drive yourself. Okay. If you, uh, you know, as you take her out and you feel that she gets more and more comfortable with people, and you feel like, you know, wow, she's starting to starting to like people more. She feels comfortable with people. We take her out and she feels comfortable. As you start to see that developing and improving, then you can start letting people know, hey, just here's a tug. Just play tug with my dog. That's it. Play tug with my dog. Here's a flirt pole. Just move that flirt pole around. They don't even have to be like professional decoys. They could just be, you know, some of your helpers. Or just okay. Go, Here's the flirt pole. Just, just play with my dog real quick. You know, they're nice and easy, nice and gentle. If your dog wants nothing to do with it, that's fine too. If your dog starts engaging, good. That means now your dog is going to start getting comfortable playing tug with somebody she doesn't know. 
Okay. Right? Once you get that, and then you start bringing her to the field more often, and you go, hey, you know, she actually feels comfortable playing tug with me with a helper. Um, then what we'll do is we'll just keep working her in prey drive. Okay. But we go, here's a, a little sleeve now. We'll keep working you in prey drive. We'll give you prey drive, prey drive, movement, movement, movement. Um, and then once her grip starts developing, once she starts getting more confident, once I start to see that she's getting into this into these fights with you know just pure pure prey, then we can start kind of channel, channeling the uh, the exercise into more of a protection based scenario. Okay. Oh, I do one. have a question, real quick. Yeah, of course, please. Um, her her breeders had had some concerns that her dogs are too defense oriented, and that's one of the reasons that they don't do very well in like PSA. Yes. Do you have a, any thoughts about that statement? And did they specifically say PSA, or did they say protection sports in general? Uh, protect. They said PSA. It was PSA. They said PSA. They said, they said PSA. Um, yeah. So I have seen, I have seen, um, I think like a couple of courses on the field before. Yeah. For for their PDCs. But they're not going uh, very high up. I know that. The ones I have seen, no. And but here's the thing: like once they got their entry level, like during their in, their entry level, they, it was clear that these dogs were in prey mode. Okay. Like. You know, like they were having fun with it. They were like, "Yeah, this is this is a blast." It wasn't like, "Oh my God, I have to bite to survive." Yeah. So when I when I did see that, I mean, it, you could clearly tell it was, um, you know, definitely a good combination of genetics and good training. Okay. Because yeah, if if they're strictly on defense mode, they're not going to do well. Right? Defense yeah, I guess mode that's is not what you were saying earlier. Yeah, it's not going to cave them over because PSA specifically has so much stress to the dog. You know, like even dogs that are bred for this type of work, it's still a huge challenge for a lot of them to do PSA. It's a a very hard, hard pressure sport. And I don't know that I I necessarily want to do PSA anything at this point because of how nervy she was Mm -hmm. in that situation it's immediately become more about just overcoming any weak nerves and any um, you know default to defense because she's feeling threatened she's got to get over that yeah that's that's what it immediately became is just overcoming the weakness Mm -hmm. no matter how long it takes right and then, then eventually what you do is you, um, like one, once the dog has been properly developed in prey drive primarily, and your dog's already, you know, she already has like that maturity going on for her. Then for protection dogs, like not sport work, you know, sport work and protect and person protection, they, there are some overlaps there, but but the approach can be very different. Like in some instances, it can be different, right? Um, then what we can start doing is we can start doing like realistic scenario-based training uh, where not so much we're going to put you in defense and you have to react and, and bite and protect, but mostly we're going to teach you some scenarios so that you learn to differentiate when it's okay to do this and when you don't have to do this. Yeah. Right? Cause if you have a dog that is like constantly looking out for threatening situations, very stressful, not reliable. That would drive me nuts. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't yeah, you want you to, <laughs> yeah. Most people can't have, <laughs> most people can't handle that. Um, and, and then what you want to do instead is you want to let the dog know, Hey, you, you just be very confident and very happy still can like people. If you can like this guy that is talking to me right now, you can love the guy, be friendly with him, wag your tail. Like if he's inviting, you can let him pet you. But the second there is a shift in his demeanor, 
mm-hmm. you light them up. Like yeah. that, that is a nice personal protection dog right there. It's the type of dog that can be your friend one instant or one second, and the next second, the, the moment you switch to a different type of intention, they'll light you up. Yeah. And there are dogs. Like you could actually train dogs to do, to do just that. Uh, and then what it is is just scenario-based training, where you basically basically put the biting and the and the defense under stimulus control. Where okay. you go, this is an, this type of scenario. That's the switch. And that scenario turns off. You you're back to being his friend. Uh, you're back to being normal. You're back to being cool. This happens. You light up. This doesn't happen. You're good to go. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, that that's the type of dog that's not going to be a liability to you. It's going to be much much happier and much much more confident. Good. So, and we won't really know. Well, I have I have to do all the groundwork and you know all the foundation we're talking about and and then whatever else you see needs to be added along this path before mm-hmm. we're going to know right what what I could or couldn't do with her in the first place. Is that correct? Right. Right, you're talking about, um, are you talking mm-hmm. about, like, genetics? Well, yes, genetics, temperament, foundation, and whether or not it would be better to pursue sport work or it would be better to pursue just personal protection type scenarios. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, okay. as the dog matures, we could always, I mean, this stuff happens, like, all the time, where you go, I have a plan for this dog, and I want to do this with this dog, and then genetics come in and they tell you actually you can't go this way yeah and I don't really have I know I want to do I know I want her to have the capability to perform personal protection and not back out of a situation if it's dangerous should that ever happen I know that okay Mm -hmm. but other than that the only thing I know is I cannot stand having a dog that has weak nerves Mm -hmm. especially if I have her from a puppy so I want to do everything I can to continue a foundation where that doesn't happen and where she has the potential to do one of these things we're talking about as she matures. Because I would yeah. like to do sport work, but my interest in doing sport work has more to do with myself than it does with my dog. Does and, you know, sense? a lot of – no, that makes perfect sense. Actually, most people get into sport work because they want to do it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like there aren't that many people that go. I think my dog would love this, so I'm gonna do this. Usually, it's kind of the other way around. It's like, man, I want to get into PSA, I want to get into IPO, I want to get into this sport, I want to get into herding, uh, yeah. you know, sheep herding. I want to get into, uh, you know, this, and so they get the right dog for it, mm-hmm. um, or they get into it because they pursue that. Um, but you know, there are people that go, hey, you know, what? I think my dog will be good at this. Let me give it a try. Uh, and kind of having a little bit of a balance of both is great because you have to you have to know right. Like so, let's say we're doing everything we outline. We're like, hey, we're gonna make the dog a social butterfly. Dog's gonna we're gonna make this dog so comfortable around everything that it and never feels like it has to be afraid, right? Yeah. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do the lay the foundation that way. And then we're going to do this and this and that. But let's say somewhere along the way, as the dog matures, we realize that this is not that type of dog. We realize that, you know, like we've tried to really, we've tried to really, uh, you know, make her confident, make her comfortable, make her a social butterfly and, um, and have her have some confidence so that she can, so she can discriminate certain scenarios, but it turns out that she actually feels like every scenario is threatening to her. I have seen dogs that are like that too, you know, and I'm sure you have. Yeah. Um, then what you do is you go, well, our plan there just kind of got sidetracked, but um, depending on how bad it is, you might even just go, well, she's maybe not going to be able to do X, Y, and Z, but Maybe she can still be a good presence dog. Yeah. You know, like that alone is such a huge thing for a lot of people. And the reality, here's the reality of things, right? Most 
personal protection dogs will never see a real bite That's in their true. lives. Yeah. yeah, I know that. They really won't. So most of the time you're just dealing with presence. So if that's the case and, you know, you're happy and it still serves the purpose that you got her for, man, that's still a win. Yeah. You're absolutely. still winning on that. Um, but, uh, you know, if you feel, well, you know, that, yeah, that's still a win, but I still want to keep doing this. I still want to do that. I still want to stuff with dogs. Then you have two options. One, you get another dog. Or two, um, I don't know how you would feel about this. The other option is contact the breeder back and go, hey, so it turns out this isn't quite what I was looking for. Um, a lot of breeders, they have like a buyback policy. And I'm not sure if you breed or that. Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Do you have any any other questions? No. All no, just, I all of this make sense? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it all makes sense. It's all what I needed to know. And uh, I feel like I've got a good starting spot. So, Perfect. Thank you. Well, yeah, no problem. If you have any other questions, just let me know. I will. I'll see you Wednesday if y'all are out there.